Hello friends, Steve from Southern Illinois here, and um, yeah, spring has sprung. We have gone from daffodils uh, to uh, the red buds now are in their total glory here. Let me spin, spin this just a little bit, and as you can tell, um, the woods have started springing forth leaves. And as I was driving last week down to El Dorado, the farmers are in the fields. Yeah, spring is fully here. So today's a little bit windy, a little bit rainy, so we're going to try to squeeze this in between showers. So uh, last week I told you that I didn't know if I would be here, this week. and uh, I think I'm going to get blown away anyhow. So um, yeah, something happened this week. The family asked me to start meeting with. Them. They want to build a spiritual life together. And so that's required some preparation for that. And I thought I'd just share some of the fruits of that preparation with you today. Okay. As a part of part of helping them build a spiritual life, we're going to be looking at um, pictures of belief that the Bible presents. You have to understand the Bible, for me, is not a textbook, and there are very few logical presentations in the Bible. Uh, rather, it's a collection of stories and letters, each with their own context, their own perspective, and each of them convey their, make their own contributions to helping us understand what it is to live a spiritual life. For me, that's what the core of the Bible is about. The last few weeks I've been sharing my personal experiences that have made God believable in my life. My experiences haven't been your experiences. All you have are my stories. And so this creates a challenge for us. Are we going to accept the stories of others as a basis for our own belief? And we face that same challenge with the Bible, because it's the same thing. They're sharing, we're, we're looking at the experiences of other people with God and saying, is that believable? So for the fr next few weeks, well, hello, okay. My new swag from the University of Evansville uh, still had the tag attached, I apologize. So for the next few weeks as this family and I are meeting, together, I'm going to share what I find in the Bible that shapes and strengthens my spirituality and makes God even more believable for me than my experience alone. So the first question that I think we need to ask is, what is a spiritual life? And we've got to understand that this is a relatively young question. As our Western culture has developed, it's sought to move away from the religious context in which it was formed. Religion, by its very nature, focuses on the personification of spirituality. To be spiritual in that context meant to be focused on spiritual things. And depending on your religious context, that would be gods, God, spirits. The concept of spirituality as we understand it today in Western culture arose as we struggled to retain meaning and purpose in our lives while removing the supernatural. God was treated as unbelievable or at least unnecessary. And initially this was called philosophy, but the philosophers went off on cere in cerebral directions asking questions that had very little bearing on our day-to-day our -day lives. And so spirituality stepped in to take the place that philosophy had been filling. But the Bible predates all of this transition. In the Bible, God is treated as believable. The 
supernatural is treated as believable. And a spiritual life, therefore, was a God-centered life, a life built around the pictures of God that the Bible paints in its stories and its thoughts. And for me, this is the center of Christianity, finding meaning and pur purpose through focusing on a believable God. That's what spirituality has come to mean in my life. And Bible study is simply getting to know that God that the writers of the Bible focus their lives around. So let's spend a little time exploring this project, this subject. Vivian and I live in a little subdivision outside of Fairfield. It's quasi-country, okay? As you can see, we've got some second-growth woods be right beside us. There's a fallow field on the other side of there, but then there's a farmer who farms a field next to us, okay? We've got a country road to walk along, and it's, it's really kind of a nice country road, okay? Uh, I love it. You know, we've got a few houses here with yards and always flowers or trees or dogs to interact with as we're walking. Don't tell Whip, Vivian I mentioned the dogs. She doesn't like me interacting with dogs. Okay, But then uh, as we go down to the road just to the north, okay, uh, that used to be a, a pine plantation. Somebody planted pine trees there years ago, I presume planting us on harvesting them, but then they sold off the land, so when you walk through there, you can smell the smells of the Pacific Northwest, of the, the, the magnificent conifer forests out there, and it's like I'm transported back to some of the trips of my childhood. I love walking along our road, and Vivian and I do it on a fairly regular basis. Um, it's good for us old folks to get out and move, and uh, also it's great communication time. But in the spring, when we start walking, all of the weeds have, are, are dead and have been flattened down by the winter snows. And so what do you see in the ditches? All of the junk people have thrown out their windows through the whole year. So this time of year when we're walking along the road, we see beer cans and pop bottles and wrappers from all kinds of packaged foods, fast food containers, okay? I mean, you'd think we lived in Trash City Central. So we've developed the habit every spring of for a couple of our walks we'll take on a trash bag. This year I just used to hold the top of the bag. And uh, we'll just start picking up trash out of the ditch. But you know, <clears throat> this week as we were walking and I was thinking about believability, I thought, when I pick that pop bottle up, or that fast food container, I never wonder where it came from. Every piece of trash that we pick up, I know that somebody, someplace, sometime designed it, somebody made it, somebody used it, somebody discarded it. Everything that we pick up had a maker. The writers of the Bible, when they looked at the world around them, they had that same experience, that same perception of everything they saw. When they looked at the redbud tree, they saw the signs of a maker. When they looked at the clouds up in the sky, they saw signs of a maker. As our Western culture has excluded the supernatural, we have fractured reality into things that were made, things that have purpose and meaning and design, and things that are meaningless, purposeless, and have no design. That was an alien concept to the writers of the Bible. 
And to them, that evidence of purpose and meaning and design all around them in nature was one of the most powerful statements that made God believable in their lives. Now, for those of you who are still struggling with the intellectual questions, I understand, okay? I am fully aware that the arg about the arguments against the maker are there, okay? Uh, and there's some very good arguments, you know, uh, they're, they're very good questions. They're intellectual problems and, and, and paradoxes. How do we explain this? How do we explain that? If God, then what? Okay? All of those intellectual problems, they're there. Okay? But let me ask you this. Do those intellectual problems meet the longings of your heart? When we follow the intellectual questions that have been asked about creation, about having a creator God, and we follow down the evolutionary pathway, we end up with a statement that at a cosmic level there is no purpose, no meaning. Hence, there is no foundation for spirituality. Spirituality, meaning, purpose are all artifacts created by humans uh, to ease our anxieties, just like religion. And I don't know about you, but my heart craves meaning and purpose this past week I had a really bad spell with my chronic fatigue syndrome and for a couple of days I couldn't work and let me tell you when I'm unproductive I have a really rough time spiritually because I feel purposeless and meaningless it takes real discipline for me to go back to the foundation of my meaning and purpose which today is the fact that I am part of God's creation I have a maker a designer and he's happy with me so that's an example of how the intellectual problems don't meet the spiritual needs of my heart Now, the Bible writers, okay, they express this in various forms, this concept of, of seeing the hand of the maker every place. So one of the poets in Psalms 139 put it this way, You created every part of me. You put me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because you're, to be, you're awesome. All you do is strange and wonderful. I know it with all my heart. When my bones were being formed, carefully put together in my mother's womb, when I was growing there in secret, you knew that I was there. You saw me before I was born. Another poet looked up at the sky and he said this, how clearly the sky reveals God's glory, how plainly it shows what he has done. Each day announces it to the following day. Each night repeats it to the next. No speech or words are used. No sound is heard. Yet their message goes out to all the world and is heard to the ends of the earth. That's in Psalms 19 if you want to look it up. Okay. Thinking about where all humans came from, one of the storytellers of the Bible, usually attributed to Moses, Put it this way, in the beginning, God created the universe. Then God said, and now we will make human beings 
They will be like us, resemble us. They will have power over the fish, the birds, all the animals, domestic and wild, large and small. So God created human beings, making them to be like himself. He created them male and female. That's in Genesis chapter 1. And finally, one of the letter writers put it this way. He existed before everything. And he holds everything together. That's found in Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. And if those don't, verses don't sound familiar, it's because I'm using a modern paraphrase because I want them to sound different to Christians. And I want them to be understandable to those of us who are spiritual but not religious. This was the worldview of the men and women in the Bible. When they looked around them, God was believable because they saw him reflected in the creation around them. So here's the first take home from these touchstone talks. The writers of the Bible assert that God is at the center of reality and created the world that we live in. And for them, them, this was so believable that they built their entire lives around the presence of that creator God. So I have a question for you. Would you be willing today to set aside your intellectual questions, your problems, whatever they are, and embrace the possibility that you're not a random happening? That there is someone who created you, who made you, who designed you, who's far above human? That there's a maker, a God at the center of reality? That your life is part of a greater design? You don't have to manufacture meaning and purpose for yourself. That spirituality is woven into the fabric of the universe rather than something that we have to dig up for ourselves. It took me decades to find the courage or the desperation to accept that, to take that risk, but I've never regretted, for, regretted it for a moment since then. But for those of you who are religious, I want to ask you this. You say you believe. You say God is believable. But is he at the center of your spirituality? Or does your spirituality re exist in religious forms and habits? I know I'm spiritual because I go to church. That makes me good. I know I'm spiritual because I read the Bible. That makes me good. In our uh, Sabbath school Skype this morning, we read the passage where Jesus says, don't you know that God wants mercy and not sacrifice? He wants the spiritual fruit, love, mercy, grace, kindness, compassion, much more than he wants religious forms. So for those of us who are religious and spiritual, it becomes an even greater challenge not to get sidetracked on the religious, but to live the spirit of the religion. Now, if you'd like a more interactive experience and you live here locally, you're welcome to join us on Thursday afternoons. We're going to be meeting around 1 o'clock at the church at 1113 Southwest 6th Street. Okay, You're welcome to join us. I'll be there fully masked, uh, socially distancing. We're, we're, I still take COVID seriously, okay? Michigan shut down elective surgeries again this week because the surge is happening and threatening the health system. Deaconess is still having red line days where they don't accept transfers except on an emergency basis, okay? COVID is still among us regardless of the behavior that we see around us. So we'll be taking this seriously and doing what we can to stay safe. But you are welcome to join me. If you don't want to come live 
and you'd like to join remotely, just reach out to me, PM me here on, on Facebook, and um, we can arrange that too. Okay. Otherwise, I'll see you all next week. Be safe, friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. Have a good week.